seems like Israel was always just messing up. God delivered them today. They mess up tomorrow. He delivered them the next day. He, they mess up the next day. It, God is so merciful. But for this time, 40 years, 40 years, he had them in bondage. Now, what you need to understand is that they were surrounded by a lot of enemies that would come in and take control. They oppressed Israel so much that Israel was so frustrated. But the problem was they enjoyed doing a bad thing. So God had to put them through a little trial. Here's how bad they were. They knew that all the surrounding cities or countries around them were believed in idol worship. What the folks from Israel were doing were now intermarrying into those with those other individuals. The problem was is that they did not worship God, they worshiped other gods. And in worshiping other gods, here is where they put now remember, they are God's chosen people. And to insult God, when they married into these other folks around them, they were naming their children the name, they were giving their children the name of the gods. Now, that's a slap in God's face. How do you insult God like that? So for 40 years, God had them punished. Not that he wanted to do, but until they came to the point where, and say, Father, forgive me. So they did start asking after 40 years for God to do something for them. God chose a family from this little country called Zora. This country seemed to be positioned on a hill so they could look at all their enemies below. He said, your deliverer is going to come out of this group. He was from the tribe of Dan, and if you go back, you know, um, Jacob had how many sons? He had all these sons and all these tribes, and we're talking about the son of Dan, which is from that tribe, the Danite. He was going to choose a deliverer from there. Sometimes when God tells you to wait, we sometimes can't wait. We want to make sure we push God's hand. So 40 years is not, it's a very long time. But people were praying that God would do something. So God saw a woman. Interesting to note, the woman is not given a name. So we'll call her, we know the husband's name. In verse 2, he tells you who the husband is. If you can get this verse 2 up on the screen. His name is Manoah. Just keep the scriptures up there because I'm going to walk straight from the scriptures today. So we're going to call her Sister Manoah. They have been trying to find out what her real name is, but they have not been able to do that. So historians have, the, from the rabbinic group, said they found a name some time ago, and it's pronounced as Hazelel Pony. Now, folks can't pronounce that name too well, but that was the name they said she was. The angel came to her and said, you're going to bring forth a child. The problem with this is that they were not able to conceive any children. Brother and sister Manoah didn't have the ability to bring forth children to the world. But when God tells you something, it might not happen tomorrow. It might not happen in 10 years. It may not happen in 20 years. But it will happen. We just need to be patient. So here now, she's now expecting a child, but now she's going to be given strict instructions. Verse 4 tells us, if you go to verse 4, it tells us that 
Now therefore beware, I pray thee, that what? Drink not, nor, and eat. For thou, for lo, what? Thou shalt, verse 5, for thou, lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a, no, shall come. For the child, it shall be a, unto God from the womb. Who is a Nazarite? If you go all the way back through the, the Bible, the talk about the Nazarite, a Nazarite was somebody that had to be set aside. It's not just any kind of guy that comes up here and say, I want to be a part of this religious sect. No. A Nazarite, there are three things about a Nazarite you need to know. A Nazarite had to abstain from wine or any kind of strong drink, number one. I need you to remember these things because it's going to come in handy as we go on. Had to abstain from what? From wine and... Okay, it, a Nazarite had to refrain from cutting the hair from their head. Have mercy. Can you imagine from a baby you never cut your hair? But those were instructions for one to be a Nazarite. And the third thing was to avoid the contact with the dead. So they were not supposed to touch the dead, be in contact with the dead. Now let me go through this because you're going to see all of this come into play. To abstain from wine and... So in other words, grapes. Not even grapes because, you know, those, anything that ferments. Grapes, raisins. He... A Nazarite was not supposed to even go near the vineyard. Strict instructions. A Nazarite was supposed to refrain from cutting their hair so the hair would just, the locks would just grow and grow and grow. And they had to avoid the contact of anything that was dead. You got those three points? All right. Just want to make sure. This child, now, brothers and sisters, let me say this much. For the females among us who are giving birth to children, do you know that it, there are specific diets? If you eat it, your child becomes a blessing to the world? I know it's hard for us to figure that out. But God has instructions for us. If we eat what we're supposed to eat, but because we love Philistine food, we eat Philistine food and our children become Philistines. I'm not making this up. God is very... Let me, let me, let me digress a little bit here. God says in his word that if you return a tenth to him and a love offering, he's going to bless you, right? Has that changed? That has not changed. So... Why is it when God tells us about our diet, we struggle with it? So God was very clear on what he wanted this couple to do. Now, she was so excited that she went on and told Brother Manoah that an angel of the Lord spoke to her. Manoah wanted to hear it for himself, so they prayed that the angel would come back. And God hears the prayer of saints. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. When you, when you genuinely ask God for something, he will do it for you. The God of heaven came back down. How do we know it was God that came? Well, let's go to verse 11. And Manoah arose and went after his wife, because the angel called her. She went back to get her husband to the man and said unto him, Art thou the man that spakest to, unto the woman? And the angel said, Yes, I am. Have you heard I am before? Where was that? When Moses met him, I am that I am. Anytime you see I am in the Bible, that's God himself speaking. That's powerful, isn't it? Can you imagine God came down to talk to these people? Can you imagine how afraid they were? They did an offering. If you read the passage along, they now did an offering, and they brought a kid, a goat kid, and they gave an offering to God. 
and it says God accepted the offering and the flames went up to heaven and the angel God himself went up with the flames they were so afraid that they thought that God was going to strike them dead because no one has ever seen God and lived but they did and God blessed them I'm going somewhere with this so God blessed them with this child and his name they gave him a name called Samson Samson is a very interesting story I'm gonna pause the sermon here I hear some distractions here I hear someone playing with a game and it doesn't belong in here so I'm gonna ask that you discontinue that game right now this is God's time I'm not here to look popular but I'm in the presence we are in the presence of Almighty God sometimes you say these things you don't sound popular but when we're in presence of God I'm afraid and I don't want to be struck down because I knew it was wrong and continued thank you they bared a son verse 24 if you go to verse 24 and the woman bared a son and called his name Samson and the child grew and the Lord blessed him. Verse 25, and he said, And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times. Have mercy in the camp of Dan without Zorah, between Zorah and Ethiol. Can you imagine being Samson as a teenager? Nobody wanted to, everybody wanted to be on his team. Because you know his team going to win. That guy was so strong. Can you imagine Samson giving you a, a beer hug? You pray. You see Samson the next Sabbath. You say, no, 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 that's okay. We'll shake his hand from a distance. God blessed him with a certain skill set. Now, I'll tell you this. Let me pause here and I'll get to it later on. There was nothing special about Samson physically. Don't believe what you see in the movies, folks. And I will explain that to you. People like to say what Samson looked like. Don't believe what you hear in there. I've done enough research to discover this. Now Samson was a young adult. And with all the Philistine groups around him in verse chapter, uh, chapter 14 rather. He says he went down to a place called verse 1. If you go to verse 1 of chapter 14. And Samson went down to what? Timnath. And saw a woman in Timnath of the daughter of the Philistines. Now, brothers and sisters, as a Nazarite, he was supposed to stay within his own circles, right? But he saw this damsel, whether she was in distress or not. The Bible said, she pleases him. That's God's man. He's a Nazarite. Supposed to be focusing on God to be the judge for Israel, to protect Israel. But he saw a damsel from the other side of town. And he told his parents about it. I'm glad he told his parents. He didn't just elope. He told his parents about it. And his parents encouraged him or discouraged him, however you want to use the words, don't get yourself involved with that girl. She may have all the numbers in the right place, but stay away from her. But he was so intrigued by this girl that he couldn't take his eyes off her. Have mercy. And he encouraged, he tried his best. You know, young people like to justify why they do what they do. And let me pause here. Children, sometimes oh, young folks think they know everything. And we are so old, we don't know too much. 
Hello, 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 hello. Okay, Mark, yes? God brought our parents into this world for a particular reason, to guide us. And the fact that we have parents is to help us through life so we don't make the errors that they made. So now they're begging Samson, please, don't you see any of the girls here at Faith Church? <laughs> well, they're nice, but I like what I see out there. Don't you see any of the guys around here? No, oh, that guy looks too nerdy. I want someone with all the muscles in the right places. And isn't that true, folks? We want what's out there. We can't see what's within. So Samson was able to influence or persuade his parents, and they decide they want to go meet this girl because they're going to get married. Now here is a part in verse 5. This is the part that gets me. Then, verse 5 of chapter 14, then what? Then went Samson down to? To where? To Timnath, right? And came what? And behold, I roared at him. Now, you know why the lion roared at him? I said something earlier of one of the things. He went past the what? He was not even supposed to pass the vineyard. God gave him so much instructions, and he ignored it. The lion didn't attack him, you know. Hello? It said the lion roared against him. It was Samson that attacked the lion because if you go to the verse, and the spirit of the Lord, what, came mightily upon him and he rent him. So don't listen to the movies that tell you that. The Bible is very specific on things, you know. He went after the lamb because God would put the lion there in the vineyard to tell you why you're passing the vineyard. You see what you happen when you study the word of God? And this, God gave him a gift, and he knew the gift he had in him, so he used the gift that God had gave him to rip the lion to threads. What kind of strength do you have to rip a lion apart? Have you ever seen a lion recently? I'll pause here to share a story. Last Friday, I had a friend over in the garage. I shared the story with some of you. And I ran upstairs, I was doing something, and then I hear the horn honking outside that something was going on. So I ran downstairs to see what was happening, and the young man said, there's something in your garbage bin. And you know I'm crazy enough, they know I'm crazy at home. I ran up to the, the big garbage bin and said, hey, get out of there, whatever it was. Then I what, looked at me and I looked at him. It was not a pretty sight. I saw a nice big bear looking at me, and I looking at the bear. But I learned something many years ago when I wasn't too converted. I learned there was a pop star that know how to do the moonwalk, and you know how to slide backwards without it actually getting to you. When that thing stood up, I said, oh Lord Jesus. In my head real quick, I was saying that the funny thing, my friend was there videotaping everything. So if I had died on the spot, we had it on camera. What was interesting, in my head real quick, I started to think of how did David kill a bear? How did Samson kill a lion? With all my defense mechanism I, was, I knew how to do over the years, I realized that was a huge bear. And it stood up on his back hind legs and looked at me. Now, I'll end the story. I can't tell you what I did, but I'll tell you this much. I was able to disfellowship it from our house. I'll leave the story right there. You can see me after how I got rid of it. But how did these guys kill these creatures? These things are huge. The closest I've usually seen it was at a zoo, but this thing was standing there. No, he had to have a certain skill set. First of all, a lion is strong. It's the king of the jungle. And he ripped that lion to threads. What kind of strength did he have? But God gave him a sign. 
don't go to Timna. Don't walk past the vineyard. The lion is there to get you away from it. But he ripped that thing apart and went on down and married the girl. Talk about sleeping with the enemy. Where Timnath is, as opposed to where um, Zora is, it's only about four miles walk. So those of us who used to walk a lot, four miles is not, nothing much to walk. Now, check this out. They got married. Typically in the Hebrew custom is that when you get married, you marry and they, the festiv festivities go on for about a good seven days, right? When he got married to this girl, they brought a companion of about 30 people to be with him. Now, you know that was not, if you see 30 people come around you to be with you, that's not necessarily a good thing. So he had a riddle for them. Let's look at verse 14 together. And here's what the riddle says. And he said unto them, out of the eater come came what? Come on, let's read it together here. Verse 14 of chapter 14. Out of what? So he gave a riddle, and they, he's a judge, remember. So judge have a way. God gave him a special gift. And so he could put some riddles together that nobody could figure out. Three days went by. They could not solve that riddle. So guess what they did? These jokers, these 30 men, met his new bride and say, you better tell me what that riddle means. Because I need to know what that riddle is all about. Because guess what? In seven days, at the end of seven days, guess what would have to happen? He would have to give 30 pieces of garment to these 30 people if he... If they won, no, if he lost, he would have to give 30 pieces of garment to them and some linen also. If he won, they would all have to give him 30 pieces of garment. Can you imagine how much clothing he would have for a long time? And they threatened her that if you don't tell me, I'm going to kill you and your household. The Bible is interesting, isn't it? The interesting thing is that she pleaded with him, cried. You know, our females are very good at convincing men. I have to be, let me stand behind the pub so I don't get shot here. <laughs> Safe place. They know how to convince every and any male. That's your skill set. When she was done with poor Samson, Samson told her, the riddle. And verse 18 says what? That was verse 18. Says, let's read it together. And the men of the city what? Verse 18 of chapter 14. And the men of the what? City what? Yes. Have mercy. If he did not plow with his heifer, you see what he called her now? In a matter of, of in less than seven days, he's saying some negative things about his wife. Because his wife sold him out because he never gave this, told the secret, not even to his parents. But, you know, it's his wife. He's supposed to share everything with the communication. We men are not too good at communication. But because he was hanging out with the devil, he was hanging out with the enemy. You see what happened? And as a result, if you read the story, he was so angry that he left his wife. This is a man of God. The judge of Israel now left his wife. And here is what's funny. On his way, he was so angry that when he he found foxes 
First, chapter 15, verse 4. Just stay with me on the story. Sometimes we read these things, but we don't understand what they really mean. He got together 300, how many? 300. Oh no, how, can, how can one man get together 300 foxes? That's impossible. But you need to understand, where do foxes live? They live in holes. So here's what he did. He went into each one of those little burrows and set it on fire. And you know foxes have these nice furry tails. The, the enemy had a nice field farm and he let them through because once the fire gets to your tail, they're running into the woods. And you know to, to ignite fire is wind. So the more they ran is the more the fire came and it burned down the entire field. That's the spirit. When he asked the spirit of the God to, God to come upon him, that's what he did with God's spirit. You see, when you're not focusing on God, God didn't, God, if you notice, God didn't take away the talents from him. And he misused it because he was angry. Remember, he messed up. His parents told him, don't get married to this person. And he went ahead and did it. And now he's angry that God forgot about him. You see how we get in trouble at times and then we wonder what did God do to us? We got ourselves into own, own trouble. So now they've burnt it down. Guess what they did? They came, saw her and her father and burnt them to death. His wife, his first wife was burnt have mercy. It's right here in the Bible. So now he was without a wife and he was so angry that he went up to the Philistines. Have mercy. And started to kill people. Remember, God gave him a special gift. And every time the spirit, he asks for the spirit of the God to come in, his spirit of Jehovah to come into him, he uses it the wrong way. <coughs> when you sleep with the enemy, you're not rational anymore. Your mind is really messed up. It tells us here that one night... He killed a lot of folks, as you know, but I want to move forward so I can get, out, get you all out of here at a decent time. Then Samson, in verse chapter 16, he went to another place called Gaza. Let's read verse 16, verse 1. Chapter 16, verse 1. Then what? Didn't he learn from the first time? This time he's not, this person he went to was not even his wife. She's a lady of the night and he went in. Now, how do you figure this out? This is a man of God doing everything to oppose God. How do you do that? This Patriots and Prophet written by a lady called Ellen G. White tells that every time he did this thing, he felt guilty. Let me tell you something. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, young people, do not mess with the devil. The devil has over 6,000 years of psychology. You just have a few years. You can't mess with the devil and think you're going to win. He will tie you up, mess you up. You don't even know where you are. You will be in a bed with a prostitute and don't even know. They knew he was in town, and guess what? They said, listen, we're going to wait until daylight, and we're going to capture this man and kill him. But then the Spirit of God always worked with us, even when we're in the pit of hell. At midnight, he got up, walked to the gate, grabbed this gate. Now, you need to understand the walls of these gates 
were not small gates. Typical gate, which is your defense me fence mechanism for enemies. No one can come in. They're about 30 feet high. It's about the height from this floor here up to that ceiling. Those are not small gates. He ripped the gate off. Not only the gate he ripped off, but even the posts and the iron came with it and moved all of that stuff. What manner of man is that? And he didn't, even, he didn't even just take the gate and drop it down, you know. He took the gate and walked all the way to a mountain. It's like me taking this. Can you imagine me just grabbing the podium and hold by one hand and walk up to Avon Mountain with it? You would say, what manner of man am I? He had that strength. Brothers and sisters, God had given him another hint. Don't abuse my gift. You keep sleeping with the wrong people and getting away with it. You can only get away for so long and so far. He got away. Then shortly after that, he met another damsel. <laughs> this is a story interesting. This time she's from Sorek. Let's read it here. Verse 4 of chapter, 5, chapter 16. What does it say? <laughs> and her name was? Good. And the lords of the Philistine, let's keep reading, came up unto her and said what? <clears throat> And did what? Now, this is the interesting part. He says they need to entice him. Delilah, and this is the part I need to share with you. They asked Delilah to find out where does his strength lie. Now, let me explain this much and help me out with this. If he was built like an Arnold Schwarzenegger with muscles they wouldn't ask that question. What they would ask him is, what do you eat while you look like that? Some years ago, there was an athlete that broke two world records here, 100 meter and a 200 meter. And people were trying to figure, his name is Usain Bolt. And they were trying to figure out what makes him run so fast. Inquiring minds want to know, right? And he, the comment was made that he eats yam. You've heard that, right? Do you know what happened in the island of Jamaica during that past next two years? Every time you went to immigration, you became so frustrated. Don't blame tourism. Blame Usain Bolt. Because everybody was going there from all over the world to figure out if they can eat some yam so they can run that fast. Even I tried out it, but I haven't run any faster. Maybe I'm not eating the right amount from the northern part of the island. That's what it was about. They need, let's get back to the story. They need to find out where his strength lies because guess what? He looked like a regular guy. Don't be fooled with the muscles because if he had muscles, they wouldn't be asking that question. He was regular. See what you learn? He was a regular man, but God gave him extraordinary gifts. So don't believe the movies, folks. His hair was long. His locks was, he was locked, broken into seven areas. I can understand why the Rastafari and have some of them having seven little blocks. That's what it's all about. Because they said the strength is in their hair. Hello? Hello, someone out there. So he was, when the Spirit of God came upon him, he could move anything. He probably was my size. Because they're saying, wait a minute, <laughs> what can you do? What kind of strength do you have that you can do all these things? You don't look like this big, strong person. You don't, you don't. So guess what? She asked him and he turned to her and he said, let's say what he said. 
And Delilah said, verse 6, let's read it together. And Delilah said to Samson, what? Tell me, I pray thee what? And wherewith? And verse 7 says what? If what? If they bind me with? And every other man. So if they do, and they have this thing called a bowstring, when this green is hard to burst. So he's telling her, if you just tie me up like that, then if they attack me, then they will kill me. Poor Samson, poor Sammy. Sammy just didn't get it right. God was trying to tell him something. Get out while it's safe. And while he was, whatever she did to make him so relaxed, he fell asleep. See, when you're sleeping with the enemy, you don't know what the enemy, enemy is planning for you. What you need to understand also, how did she get to those five lords and tell them that he was asleep? There were people on her bedroom chamber positioned to hear every activity that was going on inside that room. And then when she, that's why when she said, Samson, they're about to get you. You remember that line? Samson, Philistines, Philistines are what? What did he do? He jumped up. Now, how did they come so, how were they? Because they were on the outside. And he jumped up and did what? Burst those things like. God never took away his blessings from him. Another day came about, because this doesn't happen just one after the next, you know, because she needed to give him time to cool down because he was angry every time that happened. He was mad with Delilah every time it happened, but he was so intrigued with her that he just couldn't stay away from the enemy. So she, he came back to her house again, and she says, what, where did it go? And Delilah said, verse 10, unto Samson, behold, the house mocked me and told me lies. Right? I pray thee, where with? And what does verse 11 say? Come on, stay with me. And what? And he said unto her, what? Come on, everybody read together. With new ropes. Delilah therefore took what? And did what? And he what? That's the number two. That's the number, the number two time that God delivered him. And Samson didn't get it. Brothers and sisters, this sort of reminds, this story reminds us of ourselves. How many times God has delivered us from things and we keep going back to the same old thing because guess what? We got out okay. The fact that we got out okay didn't mean it's okay. It's just that God delivered you. Then another time happened and he said what? Verse 13 I'm sorry, let's, let's, let's go to verse 12. Delilah therefore took what? Oh, we read that before, right? Okay, let's go to verse 13. And Delilah said what? Hear the wit. Told me lies. Tell me. And he said to, unto her what? Have mercy. And verse 14 says, and she did what? And what? And he what? And went what? Have mercy. Now, folks, these are not hair pins that females use in their hair. Those are not the pins I'm talking about. These are some major stakes. Because his hair was so thick, and it had seven ears to his hair. So when they run that stake down into the ground without him, I don't know how they did that. That when she said the... Philistines are upon you. He pulled everything up and walked out. What kind of strength is that? God never left him. 
even though he was going down a very dark path. But you know, Delilah had a lot at stake. And here's a part I never talked about. The five lords of the Philistines were some powerful men. And each one of them, if you look at previous chap uh, verses, it tells you that they were given, each one of them were going to give her 1,100 pieces of silver. Now, if five people give 1,100 a piece, you know I'm going to do a little math. That adds up to be how much? 5,500. So she's going to be rich. Elder Garnet, if we were to calculate this as the finance man here, if we were to calculate in today's world of silver, she would be getting over $100,000. So to get $5,500 to find out what it is that makes him weak, that was a lot of money she was going to get. So they were getting, the lords of the, the Philistine were getting very angry with her because she couldn't figure out, so they were seeing her as not someone on their side anymore. So she needed to prove, as I said, she knew how to get to his heart. She starts to cry. You know how. I'm a man. I just want to say the persons of the opposite sex. If they cry on your shoulder, it will melt the strongest of human beings. And she, poor Delilah just cried. Oh, Sam. Oh, Sammy, Sammy boy. What? Can you imagine what was going on there? Poor Samson's heart got so weak that he did something very dangerous. Verse 17, he messed up so bad. And it says, then that he what? Let's read it together. He told her all his heart and said unto her, there what? Of God. From? If what? Have mercy. Have mercy. Brothers and sisters, I just wanted to keep the story just the way it is. I'm not going to do nothing fancy because I realize God's word is powerful. He could not help himself because night after night, he was sleeping with the enemy and didn't even know his fate. Oftentimes, we play with the devil. The devil always have a bait out there. And let me tell you something about a bait. Those of you who go fishing know one thing. When the bait, a fish, doesn't go after a bait when their belly is full. If a fish belly is full, they will always ignore the bait. It's when they are hungry. Samson wanted more from what he should not be touching. He was messing with the enemy. They had 5,500 shackles of silver she needed to get for a reward. But I'll tell you this, when they cut off his hair, and she did as she normally did, and when Delilah saw that his heart, verse 18, and when Delilah saw that what? He was told her all his heart. She sent and called the lords of the Philistine. I'll pause right here. They were waiting for the moment. She made him so comfortable that he was resting on her thighs. He didn't even know what was happening around him. And they came in. It says, come up this once. For what? He had shown me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistine came up unto her and brought money in their hand. Because they realized now, this time is for real. So they came with the payment and gave it to Delilah. As one man down south said, Delilah. You will get that when you go home. Brother Paul, they didn't get that one. Delilah got him. God's man. 
in a very uncompromising or compromising position. In a compromising position. That's the last thing you want God to catch us in a bad situation like that. And you know the story well. They took him and they did something very gross. They took the sword and this is how they did it. They heat that sword so much so that the sword, have you ever burned to put a piece of metal on fire and what it turns, it turns red at the tip and they gorged out his eyes. This man of God who was supposed to be delivering Israel is so messed up now. Do you know even though Israel had an army he was really the army for Israel? He's the only man that could take the jawbone of a donkey and kill 1,000 people. One man kill 1,000 people. If, if one man can kill 1,000 people, why do you need an army? Read it, it's in the scripture. I just didn't deal with it. This man's strength was now gone. He was now in the hand of the devil, of the enemy. And they mocked him. They put him in a dungeon. It was there that Samson started to cry out to God. It's times when you're at your lowest, when you don't know where the next meal is coming from, you don't know how that bill is going to be paid on Monday morning, you don't know how the mortgage is going to work, it's when you're at your lowest. That's when you cry out to God. He will hear you. He will hear the faintest cry. God heard his faintest cry way down in the dungeon. But God would have it. Remember, Samson's only mission on the earth was to get rid of all his enemies and he failed because he mingled with the enemy. Brothers and sisters, if you think Satan is a joke, go mess with him. When he's done with you, he pulls himself away from you and leave you there. We were reading on, on, on Wednesday night that the devil wants each one of us to not pray and to not read his word. Because when you're not re praying or reading, the devil don't have to do much. He sits back and cuts his ten because brother and sister so-and-so, there's no effort. But the moment you start to pray is when he starts to mess you up. He starts to get on your back and you say, Lord, why did I become a Christian? Because Satan knows that he wants you. His time is wrapping up. But Satan can only do so much with you. There comes a point where he has to end. He can only torment you for so long. Because if you stay on your knees and you stay in God's word, Satan will have to flee. He's moving on to the next customer. That's why we as a church must spend time in prayer. That's what this sermon is about today. Spending time with God. You have a problem? Put it to God. I've been there, I've done that. If you put it to God, no weapon that's formed against you can touch you, can't prosper, because you are in God's hands. The devil will try to discourage you. Sometimes you're so weak you can't even pray. All you can say is that, help me Jesus. God will send an angel, a strong angel, come get you. That's to learn what I've learned about the God of this universe. You know the story? They brought him, all the five lords of the Philistines came to have a big celebration. And now they're going to bring, they said, listen, when the party was getting hot, let's bring out our enemy. We're going to have a show time to show them this is what. Our God, Dacon, did. They brought out this very disheveled man to, into the courtyards. And the Bible tells me that he leans over to the young man that led him. I said, if I could just get to a pillar, the pillars of his faith. He knew those were the pillars that took him through life. He knew that as a Nazarite, he shouldn't be messing with the enemy. He said, God, just help me. Sometimes you got to pray those prayers deep from your heart 
and be sincere about it, and God will move in. I'm wrapping up. I'm done. Let me say this to you. You know the story well. He led and put his arms against the pillows. And he cried out to the God. Have mercy. I'm done. He cried out to the God of the universe. He said, Lord, I know my time is up. But I have five lords of the Philistines in here. This place is full. Give me one more chance to do your will. Brothers and sisters, we might have messed up so many times. But all we need to do is ask God, give me one more chance to fulfill his will. One more. Father, I won't mess up no more. Just give me one more. One more chance to fulfill your will. You can't be so far down that God can't hear your prayers. When God hears your prayers, God will send angels all over just for you. Just for you. That's how much God wants to save us. He put his hands. He wanted to make sure his hands were against those pillars real good. And when he pushed, you could probably hear the crackling going on. They probably looked and just probably thought it was just some earthquake thing, but it would go away. And the more he pushed, the more he pushed, God gave him back the strength he needed to push and burst down this thing, the entire thing. The Bible tells us that he killed more in one moment in that time than he had killed in all of his life. Brothers and sisters, do you know who the God of this universe is? Do you know the God we serve? I learned one thing about Samson. I might be messing up every day, but every time I go to God and ask him to forgive me, he comes down and forgives me and saves me. We serve a mighty God, a powerful God, a God of this universe. A cattle upon a thousand hills belong to him. Why should I worry or why should I fret? <laughs> I'll end with this. Any one of you know, let me just say this. Brothers and sisters, see this book called the Bible? All I did today was use it. And we read scriptures. Everything you need to know is right in here for you. There's a man called Thomas Darcy. Any of you know who Thomas Darcy is? We as a church of people should know who Thomas Darcy is. Because you're not quite sure who Thomas Darcy is. Thomas Darcy grew up in the South. His father was a minister, a Baptist minister, down in Georgia. His wife was an organist in the church, Brother Paul. Every Sunday they would go to church. And he would watch his mother. He was always fascinated with his mother playing the organ. But he needed a little job to help them. So they moved from there to Atlanta. And there Thomas Dorsey started to get some night work. And while he was there doing the night work, he was, some of his work would take him into the clubs where he knew he shouldn't be. He should be in the church. He would ask some of the folks who played the piano to teach him some chords. Thomas Andrew Dorsey started to play. God gave him a gift like no other person. When you find out who Thomas Dorsey is, you won't even believe it. Because we do it every Sabbath here. Thomas Dorsey started to play jazz and blues. Got the church. The church that his mother and father would pray for him. Don't leave the church. But he started to spend time in the clubs. Everybody was fanning him. You are the best. 
musician, the best jazz musician, the best blues musician. Then one day, his hands, something started to go wrong with his hands. He can't figure out what was wrong with it. And he realized because of his years of turning his back on God, God, the skill that he had on the keyboard, he couldn't play the black and white as good as he should. And God, he gave his heart to God. Here's what happened, brothers. He would go, a lot of folks didn't like him. Because in the church at the time, God never took away his skill set of the blues and the jazz. He came to the church and some churches chased him out. Because that kind of music is not accepted in the church. But that's the only thing he knew how he had gone so far from the church. One day he was on the road with a choir he was trying to develop. And he got a telegram. For you young people who don't know what a telegram is, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a slow communication like a text message. A telegram, you will send it and the next day you get it. As unlike a text message, you get it instantly. A telegram was usually one line. He got a text message, wife has died, come home. Thomas Darcy thought it was the punishment for all that he had led astray over the years, playing the blues and the jazz. When he came home, they drove him home and he looked and he saw his wife laying there on the bed, dead. And just across the side, his wife died in childbirth, left him with a little baby. Two days went by and the baby passed. He lost his wife and his family. At the funeral, Thomas Andrew Darcy was so depressed, he went into depression. This man that could make magic on the keyboard, play for the devil, realized that this was too much. He went into depression for such a long time. Brothers and sisters, some friends came over to visit him. And his friends, he was saying things that were not appropriate. He was saying things about the God of the universe that was not right. And he said something using the Lord's name that was not right. And one of his friends quickly corrected him and said, no, he's not that kind of Lord. He's not that kind of Lord. He said, my Lord is a precious Lord. After the friends left in disgust with him, for days he stayed there in his room, depressed. Let me pause here. Thomas Dorsey wrote the song entitled, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Did you know that Thomas Dorsey is the originator of gospel, black gospel music in the United States? If you didn't know that, the church took a while to get used to him because the combination of jazz and blues was not accepted. That's what gospel music is, in case you didn't know. But when he cried out, he said, Precious Lord, take my hand. Like Samson, Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me. Lead me. You don't know the kind of God we serve. It's when you're at your lowest. When you're at your lowest. When you're at your lowest. Ask God to take your hand and lead you, and lead you, and lead you, and lead you home. 